welcome. This is Talking Art, and I'm Jane Treger. We are continuing our conversation with local artists, and today we have Ann Taylor. Um, I'd like to remind you that on the screen below is our email address, and if you have questions that you want me to ask artists that I'm not asking, please send them to me. And if there are artists that you think I should be interviewing, I'd like to see that as well. So without further ado, here we are, Anne Taylor. Welcome to Talking Art, and we are here at the Deerfield Arts Bank. We are. Happy <laughs> to be here. Good. Um, we're going to talk about your work, and we're also, but I like to start with, where are you from, and how did you get to this particular region of the world? This neck of the woods. Um, so I grew up down south in Texas. My parents are originally New Yorkers, but were expats when my dad's job got transferred. And so I grew up there and eventually went to college in the Northeast and moved to New York City after college. And then made um, a cross-country move to go to graduate school in 2010 and then moved back here in 2013, got married and settled. Yeah, but why here? <laughs> um, okay, so prior to moving here, I was in graduate school in Oregon, and Eugene is this lively, bustling, progressive town with lots going on artistically, and we really loved the spirit of that town, and when we were looking for towns, you know, on the East Coast, we had heard a lot about this area and the five colleges and all of their cultural contributions. So we were excited to move here. I had never been here, but when we did move here, I mean, I haven't been disappointed, so. Wonderful. Yeah. Another, another local artist who should be hired by the tourism industry of Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, um, <clears throat> what did you go study in Oregon? Am I, I saying it right? Oregon? Oregon. Oregon. Um, yes. I studied art history, and I focused on the history of photography, but my thesis was on a photo book created by a contemporary Japanese photographer um, named Araki Nobiyoshi. I'm butchering the name, I'm sure. But um, so I spent three years studying his work and the history of Japanese photography and ended up, you know, writing my thesis and successfully defending. So I, I was pleased to get that out of the way and accomplished. But did you also study studio arts? I did not. In high school? I studied, I, I took art classes that were just offered through my high school as an elective, yes. but nothing particularly, I didn't major in it in college or anything like that. And why did you focus on photography? For a number of reasons. Um, I was initially interested in painting and did several portraits of my family members in that vein. Um, they were based on old family photographs, and my interest in photography pretty much started there. From the paintings of your family that were based on old family photographs? The paint, well, the interest started with the photographs, and then I translated them into paintings. And then later, you went to photo photography? And then my interest in photography grew. So let's start with these two paintings that you brought in here. Okay. They are clearly, because they are, well, they're mostly gray. I was going to say they're black and white. There's no color. Mm -hmm. These are the ones that are, um, are you painting the photographs that you saw? Mm -hmm. They were black and white images. Um, the one on the left is my grandma when she was three, and I painted that for my mom um, the year after my grandma died at 94. Um, and then the one on the right is my great uncle from World War II, and I painted that for his 90th birthday. Um, and he passed away four years later at 94 as well. So you got the painting back. <laughs> yes, it's come full circle now. 
And uh, that doesn't explain why you have the gift to your mother here. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, my, my dad recently wanted to minimize. No, I didn't mean to. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean for you to explain why that. I just thought it was interesting that you, you still. It is interesting. Yeah. So this is a, this is a, a f um, there's actually a word for what you've done here. It's called grisaille. Mm. And uh, as an art history uh, major, perhaps you know that term. Um, painters would paint their paintings in color or their etchings, and then they, w and then they would, um, they would make a grisaille, gris meaning gray in French, grisaille is a form, uh, so that it could be photographed in order to produce images to put in books because they didn't have the technology of doing color photographs. Wow. So they needed, they would repaint their own paintings from color to this. So wow. here you've started this way. That's very interesting. So. Um, at, did you do a lot of these? These are the two that I completed. I have another one in progress that's kind of gathering dust. Um, it's of my grandma and my father when he was one years old, one year old. Um, but the reason I started doing these was kind of inspired by my grandmother's passing. Um, I just had collected several of her photographs and um, in kind of the grieving process, I was looking at her photographs and felt very much moved by these images of her as a child that I had never seen. Um, just seeing my grandmother as a three-year-old um, was not only surprising, but also um, it also gave me this feeling of youthfulness and this essence of her was still there. <clears throat> How did you learn to do this if no one taught you and you've never done it before? Because it looks quite adept. Um, I would say it was maybe a combination of practice and good luck. <laughs> I see. What's the medium? It's oil. So Oil? Mm -hmm. You went right for the oil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's impressive. Yeah, it's, um, I actually really like working in oil because because portraits are so painstaking, I was able to go over and over and over. There are many layers to those paintings. So oils kind of gave me that freedom to add and subtract. Well, we have a lot of photographs to look at here. Mm -hmm. And I keep in mind that uh, you spent three years studying this Japanese photographer. So that's in the back of my mind as I'm looking at some of these pictures because I think that must have been quite an influence on you. What do you think? Well, the work of his that I actually studied and wrote about was um, something called Sentimental Journey, Winter Journey. And Sentimental Journey was a photo book that he created in 1971. And they were essentially portraits of his wife um, on their uh -huh. honeymoon. Well, you don't have portraits here. <laughs> no, so I that's don't. very interesting. We're going from painted portraits to nature. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, the first one we're looking at here is um, a black and white. So we're staying in the same field, so to speak. <laughs> and next to it, I have a full, gorgeous color. It looks like maybe not the same mountain, but very close. Mm -hmm actually looks like the same mountain to me from a different angle, but never mind. <laughs> it's the same region, right? Yep. Where it's, are we? What is we this? We are in Sedona, Arizona. And I don't know if you've ever been there. No. But it's this beautiful, almost, it, it's an awesome place. The, the combinations between the rocks and the sky, you have these very heavy striated rocks um, that meet this very unbelievable skies and ever-changing skies so the right. clouds are very wispy and are almost dancing against these kind of monolithic structures explain to me why you chose to do one in black and white and one in color so i essentially i took a lot of pictures of this area and i had edited several that were in color 
and kind of converting to black and white was more of a dramatic decision for me and experimental in a way. Oh, so the black and white came after. Mm -hmm. It started out as a color photo. I see. So this is just trying one out and, and the other. Mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting. So the black and white is an outgrowth of the color. It is. So you have other things that are black and white over here. Where we have, <clears throat> we have trees. Mm -hmm. Now this black and white one, I understand why it's in black and white. It's just, it needs to be black and white, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, it does. It's a, a grove of sycamore trees, also in Sedona, Arizona. Um, are we talking about the black and white one? Yep. And what? And what are the? Oh, these are pines. Yep, and those are local in Look Park. This is Look Park? Mm-hmm. Oh. So if you look at them, the one, the one on the left with the sycamores is kind of this dynamic triangular composition of trees with the little tessellations of branches in the background. Um, I really liked the way that the trees connected with each other and kind of played off of each other, as well as the contrast between light and dark, and then the thickness of the, of the tree trunks with the kind of wispiness of the branches. And that was against a clear blue sky, so there's a nice kind of gray tonality to the background. No, it's, it's, um, it's a very strong image. Also strong and in a completely different way is, is, the, is the set of pines from where? From where, where did you say Look Park? Look Park. I was really interested. I mean, this was this little section of Look Park that had this, you know, tons of skinny vertical trees just shooting up right into the air. And I was really drawn to that, that area. Um, and just kind of the, they all seem very quiet and serene. It was a very quiet moment that day. I think in black and white it would have lost something. I do too. I like the, you can see sort of the light coming in from the right side, which was kind of the, the end of the daylight at that, on that particular day. Another couple that I'd like to put together is these leaves, mm -hmm. and I think they're the same tree. Mm -hmm. And one is in frozen, a leaf stuck in frozen water? Ice. Yes. Frozen water. Yes, frozen <laughs> Also known uh, as. Also <laughs> known as ice. <laughs> yes. And, and here they're stuck to their trees. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. So can you talk about those? Sure. Those are, I, I'm pretty sure I tried to identify them. Um, I think they are yellow birch trees, uh, leaves. and. They're the only, the only leaves that I've seen in this area around Sugarloaf that have been, that have persevered through winter time. So that is an image, the one encased in ice during winter, and then that image is from spring. So they don't fall off the trees, they just kind of are weather beaten and, um, but persevere. So to me, these kind of, embody this sense of resilience because they've survived the harshness of winter. Um, on the one hand, you have the leaf that's encased in ice. It's kind of a preservation of life. Um, and then the leaves that are against the blue sky in springtime are... And yet it's confusing. When you first told me it was spring, I said, this isn't spring, this must be fall. Right. Well. Because the leaves point, are dead. Well, they would be a little bit, they wouldn't be as brown, I guess you could say, in fall. But in the spring, they, I really liked uh -huh, the light coming through. And if you look closely, you can see the veins of the leaf. Yes. And I'm really interested in kind of getting at that inner essence or structure of plant life. Well, speaking of inner essence, uh, what is that flower over here, this purple flower? So that flower is from the Bridge of Flowers in Shelburne Falls. And um, as I'm sure you know, there are just these abundant, kind of loud, asking to be noticed flowers on that bridge. Um, beautiful, beautiful flowers. And 
I took a series of photographs and this one I really liked because it captured kind of the outside core of the flower, um, whereas several of my other ones were kind of trying to get at that center piece. Well, the center is there too. It is there, but it's a, a tad more mysterious. As centers should be. That's right. So I like to think of it as kind of a um, showing that sort of outer surface, but then there's something a little bit more um, enigmatic about what's inside. Hmm. May I take a stab at something? Sure. Is this like a portrait? Perhaps. Because a portrait you could have of a been flower. But you could have been describing a person, mm -hmm. the way you, the words you used. And I also really, I mean, it's a photograph, obviously, but I like the sculptural quality of the leaves and it's very... The petals? Mm -hmm. The petals, thank you. Very voluptuous and curvy and there's some water Centrous, droplets. Yeah. So Yes, well, we have water droplets here too. We'll get to this. This is the last one here. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and then this close-up of fern. Yep. Are you telling me that fern is really that color? <laughs> it's a uh, it's kind of a playful treatment of ferns. Ah, uh, you've area. treated them. I have. I've doctored them, if you will. But um, you've intensified the green. I have. I have. I was really going for um, kind of this hypnosis. I thought it was a, a psychotropic kind of experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps that as well. Um, but I was really interested in kind of examining the way that nature can alter our minds. Um, and when I'm out in nature all alone, there is something very powerful about finding these moments of absolute symmetry and it's hard to believe that something like that grows naturally. Uh -huh. um, and so what I wanted to do was kind of emphasize that the symmetry. The symmetry and this hypnotic effect that if you kind of look at it in any particular way, the green kind of surrounds you. So you, you said something about alone photographing. And I remember earlier, we, when we spoke earlier, you said that there was something isolating about painting. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you went to photography. Mm -hmm. But you just ended up alone in the woods photographing. So are you, aren't you alone in both cases? Well, I'm with my dog. Oh, I see. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. in a different way. I mean, when I'm looking at photographs from the past and I'm reimagining them, I'm still kind of in the past. And if I'm out in nature and capturing, you know, the movement of a leaf in the wind or the light hitting something in a particular way, there's something more impressionistic and immediate about it than kind of delving into something that um, is kind of a bygone. Well, this is family history you've chosen to. That's always can be wonderful and problematic at the same mm -hmm. time sometimes, whereas this is universal and timeless. Right, and I think that I, I think there's a couple things going on. I think there's kind of the presence of that person when I'm looking at the photograph, but also the implied absence because they're no longer here. So there's a couple things working there. But um, in nature, I, I kind of feel like there is more of a tendency toward um, toward presence and toward this vitality. It's insistently present. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, this brings us to the last one of this series down here. Mm -hmm. what, what is that? That is a sprig of wheat. It is magnificent. Oh, thank you. It is so light. So in my face, it's so, I can't avoid it. <laughs> it's, it's all its particulars and each little hair or whatever that mm -hmm. is called on a piece of wheat is absolutely clear and present. I found that in a field 
between North and South Sugarloaf and there were all of these plants that I hadn't expected to be surviving the winter. So I found this little sprig of wheat and it, it's, it's so delicately kind of arched and into my, into my viewfinder that I was really moved by capturing it. Um, but then when I went into the editing process, I found that I couldn't actually see all of those particular hairs of that wheat. So for me, it was about trying to bring it more into relief. And as a result, I had to increase the contrast between the blue sky and the red earth and also intensify the colors, the levels of the colors. Speak to me about seeing something while you're walking versus seeing behind a viewfinder. So there's kind of two acts of, of looking for me. And the first is what the mind's eye kind of captures and sees. Um, and it may be, I mean, it, it, it could just be a moment like this, but the wheat or something like in Sedona where the sky is, this, is dancing perfectly with the rock. So there is definitely a window of time. And at that point, I take out my camera and it becomes that, it becomes a mediator. And in that moment, I have, I have to act again. So there's two, two moments. But when you put the viewfinder, when you aim the camera mm -hmm. and look through the frame of a viewfinder, you're framing the picture. Mm -hmm. In your mind, when you're looking and walking, are you framing also? Well, that's the thing. There are limits in terms of the type of lens that you use. And mine is kind of a standard, maybe entry level lens. So it's, you know, it's good for capturing these kind of expansive skies and also good little close ups. For, for this kind of work. Right. But it's hard to get that kind of sweeping panoramic view that you might actually see with your own eye. So there is a process of um, a decision making process that goes on that says, OK, I have this is what my eyes can see, but this is what the viewfinder can capture. And how can I how can I translate what my eye sees into the parameters of this lens? That's a very important choice. I, I, it do is. you take a lot of pictures? I do. So I probably on a given day will take around 50 and I'll probably... But of any, of any one object? Um, maybe two or three of any one object. So then there's a third time you're looking. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the editing at, process. At, at the choice between the three views. True, true. And sometimes I won't pick any. <laughs> right, I got it. But um, so I, I feel like there is that kind of magical moment where everything has to kind of line up to produce this image that I'm, that I feel moved by enough to take to the next level of printing. I think often the public will look at certain art mm -hmm. and let's take photography for the moment and say, oh, well, I could do that. Mm -hmm. And... And then the classic answer is, but you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> this person did it. <laughs> but, you know, then there's, the, then there's hopefully, gee, I think I could do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Let me try. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hard to understand the process that an artist uses in their medium to translate. I mean, it seems, it seems easier to push a button on a camera mm -hmm. than to produce the time it takes to, to put oil on canvas and, and, and figure out how to get the thing to look like a nose. For sure. Right. For sure. Uh, but on the other hand, <coughs> you could go wrong a lot. You, as you said, you took the picture of this amazing thing and you couldn't see it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now we have the tools available to all of us mm -hmm. to make, Enhance. and that used to be only in the dark room. Right. 
Right. Do you still do darkroom work? I'm not trained to do kind of the classical techniques. It's something I would like to do to learn how to kind of manually take photographs. Um, but I have certainly practiced my, my Photoshop skills. <laughs> tell us about, this is the latest one. Can tell us about this yep. one. So this is kind of an example of where moments in, when I'm out in nature and I find this little tiny moment of beauty that I feel like nobody else will see if I don't capture it. And this was a tiny, tiny blue flower buried in thistles and shrubs. And I kind of dug my way into it and it was completely covered in dew. And I, I wanted it to, I loved its kind of reflective power. And so when I printed it, I wanted it to be on a fully black background in order to kind of emphasize and put it into um, this kind of dramatic relief against the page. But really it was this tiny little flower, a little nothing of a flower. It's amazing. Nothing like the Bridge of Flowers. Uh -huh. <laughs> so to me, what's also interesting is that when you see um, um, a dewdrop, mm -hmm. a drop of water that reflects, it's like a mirror. Mm. And in fact, you're in this picture too. Oh, wow. And, I like uh, that. Yeah, you like that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'm thinking of uh, Van Eyck. There's this picture of a couple the wedding of these people, the mm -hmm. wedding of something, and in the back wall, on the back wall is a round mirror, and in the round mirror you see the artist yeah, yeah. painting the scene. Totally. So he got himself in there, <laughs> and I think I see you in there. <laughs> in that tiny little speck. In that tiny little speck, <laughs> there she is, I Anne like Taylor. <laughs> I like that. Thank yes. you. So, um, do you think you might go back to painting? Um, at this point in time, I, I like that I can kind of use my painting skills in the context of Photoshop um, to add these kind of pictorial effects to my photos, but I don't necessarily think um, I'm going back to painting anytime soon. How about portraits of people in photography? That's something I would like to do. I'm, right. I have to come a little bit more out of my, out of my shell and kind of... Well, I got you out of your shell the <laughs> other day. You, the, the, Anne is the person who photographed the people who came with their share of chairs. That's For true. those of you who remember, you brought chairs, she photographed you, and she created a photo montage of all of the community who brought their chairs. And I'm going to see if we can do some more of that, right? Yeah, I'd like to. All right, so have you shown recently around here? Um, well, most recently I was in the Small Art for Big Holidays show here at the Arts Bank. Um, but in May of last year, I had kind of my first debut um, at the Village Spa in Northampton. Wonderful. So we look forward to seeing more of your work. Thank Perhaps you. there'll be some photographs that are portraits, just like this purple, we didn't name the flower. Maybe we don't know what it is with that, that flashy outside and that mm. secret inside. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and thank you very much for, for uh, this interview. Thank you. And um, I thank you for being here as well. And I look forward to next week. And uh, send me any questions that I'm not asking. And, uh, or any encouragements. How about an encouragement here or there? To the email down below. Or a complaint. No, no, no. Just comments, comments. Thank you very much. My name is Jane Treger. This is Talking Art. 